Hello, my name is Christian, and today I'll be discussing the youth soccer system in the United States. My major claim is that the United States development system does not allow players to reach their full potential. I'm sure we've all played AYSO or Rec before, but there are different levels of competition for youth players, and the next level above that is club soccer. Club soccer is a pay-to-play system, so although you're getting better coaching, uh, you can travel to tournaments with teams, ultimately, whoever pays the membership fees will play the games. In an article done by USA Today in August of 2017, says membership dues can range from 2,500 to 5,000 a year. Travel can cost you 500 to 6,000 a year, depending on what tournaments your team enters. So this is a major financial, uh, financial like, responsibility for families and players that they may not pay all the time. Club soccer can run all the way up until you reach high school. Next is the academy system, which starts around 13 or 14 years of age. The major pros for this is that it's a direct affiliate to pro teams. So you have your first team and your youth system underneath. It's free and you get the best coaching around the country. Um, the only problem with this is that most teams do not offer residency programs. So as the closest academy system for a pro team is the LA Galaxy, and if you had a kid from San Diego who is good enough for the pro team, but they don't offer a residency program, there's no way that the family and player can make the commute from San Diego to Los Angeles four days a week for training. Um, and compared to Europe, they start residency programs at 13, start academy at six years of age, and residency programs at 13. So the players go to school, train, eat, all next to the professional players. And so from an early age, they are exposed to the professional environment. Uh, the next step after that is NCAA. I won't be talking about high school because I feel as though high school is a miniature version of the NCAA. And if you play academy, you're not allowed to play high school. Uh, the NCAA, uh, the rest of the soccer world pretty much plays one game a week every single week of the year. But the NCAA season is four months long with nearly three games a week. In an ESPN interview with Maryland head coach Sasso Travosky, he's quoted saying, the soccer model in the United States is almost criminally insane. The article later goes on to explain that all of his players were a GPS tracker that showed them running an average of six to nine miles a game. This is close to a 10K that college cross country runners run and they do not compete in meets for at least a week or two weeks after they've completed in another meet. So the game, there are too many games in too short of time for players to reach peak performance. If you have two games over the weekend and another game midweek on a Wednesday or Thursday and a pro scout comes, you are not physically or mentally ready to play at your highest level. Now you may be asking yourself, so what do the athletes do for the rest of the season since it's only four months long. So for the springtime, since the soccer season is in fall, the springtime is your off season and the NCAA has put strict guidelines on these schools and players. The NCAA D1 Proposal 61 was passed in 2017, which is the eight hour rule. It states that in team sports, a student athlete, student athlete's participation in such activities per bylaw 17.02.01 shall be limited to a maximum eight hours per week with not more than four hours per week on a skill-related work. This means that athletes can only train for eight hours during the week and only four of those hours can be with the ball. So the rest of the four hours, you're either running or in the gym. Along with this, in the off season, you're only allowed five play dates. <coughs> so you're going from one extreme to another. So for four months, you're averaging three games a week and in the next four months, you're only touching a ball for four <coughs> hours a week with five games total. Uh, I think that, so I think the biggest reason for this too is also a lot of our young players, such as Weston McKinney, Josh Sargent, Timothy Wealth, Christian Pulisic, who is the most famous, um, are all leaving the United States to go to Europe and play. In an interview with Bundesliga.com, Christian Pulisic, talking about the United States and Germany, was saying how they grow their players 
into full professionals, you're fighting for a pro contract, and it's something we can learn from. Uh, recently, Christian Pulisic has had a lot of success, and most people know his name, but he's been pushed out of his Borussia Dortmund starting lineup by a younger player who's only 18 years old named Jaden Sancho. And Jaden comes from England, where he's been in the Manchester City Academy, training next to players, living at their facilities, and learning how to become a professional since the age of 14. Uh, so our youngest and brightest stars are leaving the United States because they don't believe that the development system here will help them reach their full potential. Thank you. All right, well, the proposition's identified. The, it's got negative phrasing in it, which is a little bit awkward, so we would want to work on that. There's not really a preview of what the supporting structure is going to be, and that's, I think, a problem. I, I do think that you identify a controversy here. Uh, the whole ex explanation of what the different uh, you know, league levels are, the club and the academy and the NCAA, I think that that's kind of... a that's sort of what your structure is based around, although it's really informative in nature as to what those things are and how they work. Uh, the closest that you come to suggesting that those systems uh, would be more effective if we did something different is in the challenge to the NCAA rules, uh, where the coach at Maryland uh, suggests that the whole system is a little in inane because of the way uh, it works. And then you explain that, which I thought was actually pretty clear. To me, that was the strongest part of the argument that says the way that uh, we do this in the uh, academic ranks, uh, the traditional ways that people might develop in um, sports in the United States for uh, other kinds of sports, doesn't work as well for soccer because you know typically you're playing too many games in a short period of time and then when you're not playing you're not allowed to uh, develop yourself in the way that players in other parts of the world are allowed to do that sort of thing that made a little bit of sense um, the you know I, I have a pretty good understanding now of the concepts that are going on here I just think it needs to be more clearly structured uh, I ultimately understand the general criticisms um, you know, I, whether or not there's any particular solution to some of these things, I don't know. If there's an equivalent to academy <laughs> uh, play or club play where you, you pay to play in Europe and it's easier to do, it's cheaper to do, then there's, then there's the question about why it's so much easier to do and cheaper to do other places than it is here. Um, if people, like you mentioned, it's not possible, the hypothetical of somebody commuting from Los Angeles to, or from uh, San Diego up to Los Angeles to uh, work with the team there. Um, if, if it was a serious uh, future that they were looking at, it seems like that would be one of those things where people would say, well, then I should move, so I should be there. I don't know that people do those kinds of things. I assume that they probably do. Is that what happens in Europe, for instance, where apparently they have these kinds of things worked out a little bit more. Uh, it sounds to me like maybe even the most particular criticism that you have is not of the club level or the academic or the academies, but rather the, um, you know, the academic approach, uh, the NCAA and the high school and the rules that they have. That seems to be where it's kind of screwing things up for being able to do the developmental thing that you're talking about. So I think there's, I think you've got a good argument here. It just needs to be structured a little bit more clearly and, and build to that particular conclusion. There's so much of this that is like informative in nature in the background, and then the argument comes up later in the speech, and it's, it, it still needs to be labeled a little bit more clearly. Uh, you've got some pretty good information in the presentation. Now, there's a lot of factual data about uh, these things, and you had some examples that you're pointing to about the, um, the I shouldn't say kids, the 
young athletes who are leaving the country and going someplace else because they don't see the same opportunities for development here. Uh, I would think there'd probably be a little bit more information like from the coach that you had at Maryland and other players in the NCAA who suggest the same kinds of things are problematic for them. They, they want to have a future in uh, soccer and they see that there are limitations so maybe a little bit more evidence that would make that argument more sufficient. The general rules though I think describe uh, something that is problematic. All right, thank you.